In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our text for our meditation this evening is recorded for us in the book of Numbers, the 21st chapter, beginning at the 4th verse. They set out from Mount Hor along the road to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became very impatient along the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Look, there is no food, there is no water, and we are disgusted by this worthless food. The Lord sent venomous snakes among the people, and the snakes bit the people. As a result, many people from Israel died. The people went to Moses and said, We have sinned, because we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed on behalf of the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a venomous snake and put it on a pole. If anyone who is bitten looks at it, he will live. Lord, these are your words, and therefore they are your truth. We ask that you'd increase our faith through them. Amen. Dear fellow redeemed, foreshadowing is a literary technique in which an author or writer will drop subtle clues or hints concerning the climax of their story. They'll put these hints and clues early on in that story or early on in the movie to kind of let you know what's going to happen in the future. But if they're really good at foreshadowing, they'll make them so subtle that you're, you're hardly going to notice them until it all comes together at the very end, at the climax. Maybe to give you one fictitious example of foreshadowing, imagine you're watching a movie and it opens with a scene of a man in his apartment and he's washing dishes and the, the camera is on him for a while but then ever so slightly the camera moves and looks up to a ceiling tile and you see a brown spot. The man looks up, he doesn't say anything and the movie goes on. But at the very end of the movie there's a pipe that breaks into the apartment and floods out the entire thing. Maybe just one fictitious example of foreshadowing there. Our sermon series for Lent, our midweek Lenten services, Road to Redemption, has contained a lot of foreshadowing if you think about it. In fact, we've been going through a number of Old Testament texts in which God has been pointing us forward to the Passion, events that are going to take place during Jesus' suffering and death. Some of these events maybe didn't seem like they meant much more than the the things that occurred at the time, but for us as Christians now today that have the full revelation of God and His Word, we can see how perfectly it all fits together, how masterful the author of the Bible was as he had all of these things recorded, even that foreshadowing that pointed forward to what was to come. Well, this evening, as we take up our theme once again, Road to Redemption, we consider the sub-theme from pole to pole. And we consider how the pole in the wilderness pointed to the pole on Calvary. You know, if you're at all familiar with Old Testament history, you might be a little frustrated with the children of Israel in our lesson for tonight. You probably know what God did for them, some pretty amazing things, right? God did these incredible, miraculous ten plagues in Egypt and led them out of slavery there. We think about how difficult their labor was, how even at one point they had to find their own straw. It was that difficult. And now what do we see from the children of Israel in our lesson for tonight? They're complaining. They're complaining that God freed them. I mean, which would you rather have? Slavery or freedom, even if it was in the wilderness? Yet the people are ungrateful, aren't they? They don't just complain about being in the wilderness. They also complain about the accommodations as well. They say they have no food. They say have, they have no water. And the food they have... What? Wait, wait, what? They had food? It wasn't the case. That they said they had no food, but then they say the food they have is miserable. And we know exactly what that food was, wasn't it? It was food that was miraculously provided to them by God himself. They hardly had to work work for it at all. The manna in the morning, quail in the evening, and yet they complain, don't they? Maybe we want to pull our hair out when it comes to the children of Israel. Don't you see everything that God has given you, how graciously he's provided for you? But we can relate, can't we? If you think about it, God has been pretty generous to us, hasn't he? 
We can complain a lot about our lives here in the United States of America. Even though we live in a country with tremendous freedoms, we're not slaves. Even though each and every one of us enjoys things far beyond the basic necessities of food and clothing, and yet we complain, don't we? Again and again and again. A number of years ago, I remember hearing a comedy routine about a man was telling a story about uh, how the way people complain concerning air travel. He said, people will tell you horror stories about their experience in airports and on airplanes. They'll complain that their flight was delayed or maybe how they had to wait on the tarmac for 40 minutes or maybe the seat wasn't all that comfortable or the food or the snacks wasn't very appetizing. And he went on to say, And then what did you do? Amazingly take part in the incredible miracle of human flight? He said, every person on a plane shouldn't be complaining. They should be holding the armrest and saying, wow, this is amazing. I'm flying. Yet we complain, don't we? We complain so many times in our life, though we have it so wonderful. God has given us so many incredible gifts. God decided to discipline the children of Israel to help them see their sin, especially their sins of ingratitude. And what he did was send poisonous snakes among them. And the snakes bit them and and people were dying. We might say to ourselves, well, God, isn't that kind of harsh? I mean, did you really have to use corporal punishment on the children of Israel? I mean, they're not two. It's not like their only language of discipline they understand is pain. Or was it? Many people wonder if the children of Israel really would have gotten the point, if they really would have seen their sin without the snakes. Maybe the same is true for us. We can maybe act like two-year-olds when it comes to our sin and when it comes especially to our ingratitude. To continue to be ungrateful for all the things that God has provided for us. Maybe to continue in certain pet sins as well. We think to ourselves, well, nothing bad is happening to me, so I'm kind of getting away with it, and, and I'm not really hurting anybody. Do we maybe need trouble occasionally? Maybe help us to realize our sin. No, God certainly can send terrible tragedy into our life to punish us for sins. We certainly see examples of that at times in the Bible. But God also reminds us that that's not always the reason for disaster or trouble. Sometimes those things just happen because we live in a sinful world. But Jesus himself said that each and every one of us, no matter what the reason is that that trouble comes, we should take it as a reminder of our sin and our need to repent to really step back from our lives, to really examine our lives, and to confess our sins to God. That's exactly what the children of Israel did. And they didn't do it in this way. They didn't say, well, yeah, I guess we sort of messed up. No, they said, we have sinned. We have sinned against the Lord, and we have sinned against you, Moses. And then they turned to the one that God had given them, the one that God had placed among them to bring his word to them. They pleaded, pray to God that he take the snakes away from us. God invites us to do the same thing in our own lives. In the midst of trouble especially, to take that as an opportunity to repent, but to turn to him and to turn to those that he has called pleading God's repentance, or pleading God's forgiveness as we repent of our sins, that we might be forgiven. No, God responded to this prayer of Moses, this prayer of the children of Israel to take the snakes away. But he maybe didn't do it in the way that any of them would have expected or how we ourselves might expect him to do that. Maybe the children of Israel expected that God would send in bird of prey to come and swoop down into the wilderness and and to grab those snakes and to take them away. Or maybe to infect them all with a terrible disease so that they'd all die. But we don't hear any of that. In fact, we don't even hear that God actually took the snakes away. 
But God does solve the problem of their poisonous bite, doesn't he? And the way in which he does that is equally strange. He tells Moses to fashion a snake and to put it on a pole, and he, he has Moses instruct the people that if any look to the snake, they'll be spared. They won't die of those terrible poisonous bites. How did that even work? Was it that the, the snake had magical powers emanating from it that kind of went into the people's eyes? It doesn't appear so. The way that it worked was this, is that God was the one that had made that promise. And as strange as it seemed to look to a snake on a pole, God was true to his word. So much so that anyone who in faith, trusting him and what he said, if you look to the snake, you'll be saved, they were. We are told that this is a bit of foreshadowing. In fact, all of this really was pointing forward to something else, something far greater that was to come many, many years in the future. Jesus himself explains to us in John chapter 3, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. He draws the comparison. Just as that snake was lifted up and anyone who looked to the snake, they'd be spared. So also the Son of Man, he himself would be lifted up on another pole, the pole of the cross, so that any who looked to him would not merely be spared from poisonous snake bites, but spared from eternal punishment in hell and have life forever. You know, hearing this familiar story of the snake on the pole in the wilderness perhaps reminds us of another snake, another familiar snake from the Bible. We can think about that snake in Genesis chapter 3. Now, the devil took on the form of a snake, didn't he? And he appeared to Eve, and he tempted her to eat of the forbidden fruit, the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He tempted her not to listen to God. God doesn't know what he's talking about. Do what feels good. Listen to your heart, Eve. Don't listen to God. And she did. As a result, she fell into sin. As a result of that sin would come corruption and ultimately death. Eternal death and punishment. Have you ever wondered why the devil tempts people? What's his game? What's he after? You know, it's good to remember who the devil is. That he originally was a good angel created by God. That apparently God gave him and other angels free will at one point. But the devil used that free will to turn against God. He wanted God's authority and power for himself. And so he fought against God. God couldn't allow this to stand. And so he was cast down from heaven. But the devil hates God. In fact, he continues to want to destroy God, but that's impossible. How do you destroy the one who has power over everything? And since the devil can't attack God directly, his play is this, to destroy what God wants. And we know very well what that is. As it says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, God, our Savior, wants all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's why the devil tempts. He wants us to lead us away from God, to lead us to eternal destruction forever and ever in hell. But this is why Jesus came. He came to solve the problem of the punishment that our sins deserve. No, the Apostle Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 3, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. The devil reminds us of that truth regularly. Cursed are you for not following God's commands perfectly. But Jesus, as we hear, it says, redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. It's really the purpose for which he went to the cross, that he might suffer our punishment there so that we could be free, so that he might take away the devil's bite. 
Many, many years ago, there was a group of pioneers that were heading out west with many covered wagons and oxen and men, women, and children. And as they're making their way across the Great Plains, they saw a, a, a very, a very fearful sight. There was smoke on the horizon, and it was getting bigger and bigger, and they realized what it was, that the grass in front of them was on fire, and the wind was blowing it their way. They passed a, a river about a day's journey behind them, but they knew that there was no time to get back there to safety. What to do? What to do? Thankfully, the leader came up with an idea. He gathered the men of the group together, and he instructed them to follow him, and they walked back a ways behind the group, and he told them to set fire to the grass behind them, many, many acres behind them, to control the burn and let it fully burn out to the ground. And they did. Then they instructed the entire company, the men, women, and children, the oxen, and everyone else, to move on back over that burnt ground. And they waited. As the smoke got closer and closer, and soon they saw the flames, and eventually the flames were all around them, and a little girl cried out, aren't we going to get burned? To which the leader responded, no, my dear, we won't get burned, because we are standing where the fire has been. And how true it was for them. Because they were standing in the place that the fire had already burned out, that fire could harm them no longer. There was nothing for them to be afraid of. They only had to wait, and the fire would pass, wouldn't it? And they'd be safe. What a great picture that is of Christ's cross, isn't it? As we think about the fires of hell, the fires of judgment that have burned out on Christ, who went to the cross to suffer your punishment for every sin you've ever committed, those sins of ingratitude, those pet sins that you harbor in your heart that you continue to fall back upon, no matter how hard you try to get rid of them. They've been paid in full by Christ on the cross. And he invites you, he invites every one of us to stand where the fires have been, to look to him as our Savior, to look upon him and to know the devil holds nothing against us. So much so when the devil tries to hold our sins up above our head and say, you are guilty, you deserve punishment. Look to the cross and say, no, Christ has paid for that sin. Because he has paid the punishment for it, because he has suffered hell, I am free. What amazing words Christ shares with us from John chapter 3. He says, whoever believes in him, the one who is hung on the pole of the cross, may have eternal life. I don't know if you noticed it, but I did something unusual at the very beginning of the sermon. I made the sign of the cross, something that I normally don't do on myself. It was maybe my own shallow attempt at a bit of foreshadowing, foreshadowing the climax or end of this sermon to point to the cross, right? It's really not just the climax of the sermon. It's, in fact, the climax of the road to redemption, As we go to the cross, the place where our redemption was paid. To redeem means to buy back, and that's exactly what Christ did on the cross. He bought you back from sin, death, and hell. He gave his life for your own. He suffered your punishment. And he invites you to stand where the fires have been, to look ever to the cross, and know that in him you have eternal life. Amen. O faithful cross, thy burden brings comfort to the world. The branches of no other tree, no banner e'er unfurled, proclaim the wondrous love of God so clear for all to see. The tree of life, the holy cross, declares God's love for me. Amen. And this time we'll continue.